Oxygen Blast Technical Seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Now, the other key technology of part that is part of Spring is something known as aspect-oriented programming, otherwise known as AOP. And if you will, AOP is really a framework within a framework. In other words, AOP is a framework within inside the Spring framework. What does AOP give us? Well, it allows us to develop what are called cross-cutting system concerns or services in code that is isolated away from business logic. I want you to think about how, for example, you might have handled logging in your most recent application. If your logging has been accomplished how I've had to do logging in lots of applications, there's probably dozens and dozens and dozens of lines of code spread throughout just about every class that essentially handle the logging. When an exception occurs, you print something to the log. When a record is stored, you print something to the log. So while there might be a set of log classes, you have to call those log classes from literally hundreds of places throughout your application. Using aspect-oriented programming, what we'll do is develop these services, these cross-cutting concern services like logging, auditing, security. In other words, kind of the ash and trash that any application must have, but these are concerns that are not related to business itself. In other words, it's not about taking orders or processing any kind of uh, order or taking care of billing. It's all about just taking care of the system concerns of our application. We're going to put that code in separate classes. And then, through declarative links, typically again through XML or, or in uh, some cases annotations, we're going to apply the calling of those services, things like logging, security, transactions, through this framework, have them be taken care of automatically almost, if you will, and applied to the business code without that code actually residing in our business code. In other words, without having logging actually written in to our order entry services or our business order services or billing services. So we're taking care of these cross-cutting concerns without actually having to write code in the actual business logic. So it isolates that which is systemy stuff from that which is business stuff. We'll learn more about AOP as well as dependency injection later on in class. Now, while Spring is based on simple, plain old Java beans, again, what we call in the vernacular of Spring, Spring beans, Spring today is a large and all-encompassing framework. In other words, it's meant to tackle almost every part of our enterprise, in some cases, again, non-enterprise applications. So, in order to help facilitate building applications across so many kinds of application areas, Spring is actually organized into several different modules. And these modules serve a couple purposes. In some cases, they help us to bring that particular module into our environment through a jar file, but also help us to find and utilize particular pieces of the Spring framework that we might have interest in. So there are modules to help us with things like persistence and things like monitoring and configuration, dealing with messages. Just about any kind of application need we might have there's probably a module in Spring today available for us to use. Now this is an often cited picture you'll see in a lot of Spring documentation, kind of the key modules that you'll need for many applications. We've got the core module, then we've got things like the web module, data access objects, aspect-oriented programming module. Some of these we're going to talk about here and then some of them we'll follow up with rest, uh, in uh, chapters in the rest of our class. So each module contains API, in other words, code we can use in our application. In some cases, many frameworks. Integration software, when it has to dovetail into, again, some of those non-spring best-of-breed solutions to accomplish particular tasks. Again, the core module is the most fundamental part of the spring framework, and the module almost everybody uses. This functionality provides a few things. First of all, it provides the container we talked about, that spring container that allows us to do things like dependency injection and AOP. The DAO module is a JDBC abstraction layer. This particular module helps us to isolate ourselves from all that very tedious JDBC code. Does anybody really like working with the connection statement and result set objects? If you do, that's fine. JDBC could certainly be used with Spring. But if you want to be lifted up a little bit from that, then the DAO module is something you'll want to look at. 
This module helps keep a lot of our data access code also vendor independent. In other words, if you ever had to work with SQL with Oracle versus SQL and DB2, you know that yes, we have an ANSI standard SQL, but not all SQL is created absolutely equal. And something like PL SQL may be a little bit different than SQL you'd use with DB2. The data access objects and the data access module help us to kind of isolate ourselves from those differences. Working with the DAO module is also something known as the ORM module. This is a module that helps us integrate Spring applications that want to do persistence with technologies like Hibernate or JPA, Java Persistence API. These modules, if you will, take those best of breed solutions and help bring them into the DAO Spring format. The AOP module, as the name would probably imply, gives us the framework with inside the framework, it gives us that cross-cutting concern mechanism to do aspect-oriented programming. The Java Enterprise module gives us all sorts of capability to integrate things like Java Messaging Service, and JMX, and EJBs into our Spring applications, but doing so again in a way that abstracts away a lot of the kind of fine details and minutia that are part of those Java Enterprise APIs. Lastly, the Spring Web Module provides several pieces for us to build MVC-styled web applications. In particular, it also offers us the ability to integrate with very popular packages in the MVC area like Struts, JFS, and Tapestry. Now, every day, Spring is getting bigger and richer. If you go out to the Spring uh, Framework website, you'll find that more projects, more uh, releases of those projects, more modules are coming and going all the time. So the Spring Framework today, sadly, is no longer distributed in a single JAR file. It's just gotten too big for that. Many of the sub-frameworks and APIs require us to download and bring in another JAR file. For example, the Spring JAR file has always been incorporated in spring.jar. That's the core module and a few others. But today, things like Spring MVC sit in their own web module and web JAR file, web MVC JAR file, I should say. So even though we have a lot of modules and even though Spring is getting big, it still tries to keep to the lightweight label. And it tries to, even in those modules, be as small as possible and non-intrusive. In other words, allowing your code not to be tightly coupled to any of the Spring API. Additionally, you'll find lots of project teams out there. In some cases, third parties have started to glom on to the Spring framework. Everybody recognizes this is a wonderful framework offering lots of capability. Why not integrate, integrate to the best, in, uh, best of breed in this DI AOP world? So if you go out to the springframework.org site and you list, uh, take a look at things like some of the Spring projects that are listed out there, you'll find capabilities that go well beyond some that I've mentioned here today. Even things like help in your IDE to work with the Spring Framework are provided. And you'll see here just a, a, a snapshot of some of those projects. Again, you need to do web services work, try Spring Web Services. Security work, how about Spring Security? You name it, and there's probably something out there in the Spring environment today, some of which are going to be listed off the Spring uh, website's projects file, and others you're going to have to do a little bit more digging across the internet for. But there's probably something in your arena to help integrate your API need into the existing Spring framework. Now, how do we obtain Spring? Well, we go to springsource.org to their download site. There you're going to find a list of releases. Obviously, the most recent release is probably the one you want to take a look at. But in addition to the Spring framework, Spring is actually one of those uh, frameworks, one of those projects that also uses lots of third-party open source jar files as part of the framework. For example, logging. There's a way to use and integrate log4j with Spring Framework. So if you'd like, when you go to the dependency, or when you go to the uh, download site, look for the dependency downloads. These will include all those third-party jar files and releases that you're going to need as part of your Spring environment. It's a little bit bigger, yep, but with that dependency uh, download, you're going to get not only the Spring libraries, but also all the open source Java libraries you need to actually run your Spring environment. As of Spring 2.5, Java 1.4 environment or greater is required. Once you move up to Spring 3, 
Java 5 is required. So those are hard and fast rules. Depending on your environment, you'll know which version of Spring you can support. Now, in the Spring download, what are you going to find? Well, in particular, in that download, you should find the spring.jar file. That jar file, again, contains many of the modules we talked about, not all of them, but many of the modules we talked about, including the most important of those, which is the core module, giving us, again, the Spring container and the basics of the Spring API. In Spring 2.5, the Spring jar file is still fairly lightweight, 2.8 megabytes. Again, growing a little bit here over time, but what Spring is trying to do, or I should say, the group that operates uh, the Spring project is trying to do is keep the, still the basics into a relatively lightweight environment and then modularizing some of those other pieces, things like Spring MVC that you may or may not need in separate jar files. All right, so now that you know what Spring is, why it's used, and where to get it, let's take a look maybe at how Spring is used. So we want to run through a little bit of an application here, if you will, kind of a hello world application in the Spring world, just to start to see how Spring works. Again, we'll be talking about more of the details of the Spring API and the Spring framework and things like the container throughout class. But this should start to give you a little bit of a flavor about how the Spring environment is set up and how it uses Spring Beans to develop and build and work with applications. In this particular case, we're going to be building an application that is really just a Java SE application. Remember, Spring Framework was meant to build enterprise applications. But this sample code should give us the indication that the Spring Framework can be really used for all types, shapes, and sizes of application. And in particular, what we're going to build is a simple little electricity calculator, or more appropriately in Spring vernacular, a simple electricity calculator beam, which can be used then in other Java SE applications. So let's take a look at a simple little Spring application. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led .NET, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.